We are glad that you've joined us today. Sage Hills Church is a group of people who are risking their comfort to reach their community to release freedom in Christ. We want to hear how you are living this out and share your story with us by emailing us at amen at sagehillschurch.com. If you would also like to contribute to this ministry financially, please go to sagehillschurch.com slash give. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Now let's hear from God's word. Hey, it's great to see all you guys smiling faces here at church this morning. If you're joining us online, we're glad you're with us. I know a lot of my friends and my own family's at home sick uh, with the stomach flu. So hi, family. I love you. I miss you. I hope you're feeling better. And uh, if you're on vacation, we're glad you're at least streaming us online from wherever you are in the country. Uh, we are excited to be wrapping up our series this morning called Momentum. So if you're a guest, you haven't been with us this whole time, this is your first time, just know that today Today is the last part of this last uh, six-week series we've been in the book of Joshua together. So the book of Joshua is a very important book in the story of the establishment of God's promised land to his people. The people had been traveling around the desert for the last 40 years and they're right at the uh, border of the promised land when Moses dies. Their fearless leader dies and this man named Joshua became, becomes the guy that's going to now take the people from the idea of a promised land to the actual acquisition of the promised land. So over the past six weeks, we've been talking about what it means to get, keep, and keep on with God's promise. Get, keep, and keep on with God's promise. And so today I want to share with you what we do when we receive God's promise is as important to how we acquire it. Let me just say that again. What we do when we receive God's promise is as important as what we do to acquire God's promise. And so today I want to talk to you about what to do when you receive God's promise. It's been a delight to be in the book of Joshua together. I've heard lots of great stories of friends saying that they've gained some new perspective on the Old Testament, how they've gained some new momentum in their life. But today, what I want to share with you about is how you keep that momentum uh, a lot of you know that I played football in high school. Uh, those were my glory days. Um, and I say play, but I really mean as I watched football in high school. I didn't get a lot of playing time because I wasn't very good. But um, I was on the team at one point, and um, my sophomore year, I had this audacious goal of making the varsity football team. Now, there were uh, 3,500 kids in my high school, okay? So I had a very large high school, over 140 kids on the varsity football team, all of which were better than I was. But my sophomore year, I had hopes that I was going to make it, and I knew that in order to make the varsity football team, I had to learn how to lift weights. And um, I had a friend who was a, a, a very accomplished uh, football player and a very accomplished weightlifter, and he had committed to show me how to do the weightlifting necessary to get me to my promised land varsity football. And the reason why I wanted to be on the varsity football team is because that's what everybody talked about. They were all the cool people. So anyway, so I, I, I set out on this regiment of exercising and uh, lifting weights, and one of the lifts that I learned how to do was called the power clean. Have you ever heard of the power clean before? Anybody out there? Just raise your hands. The power clean, right? It's the lift where you get the weight and you bring it up to your knees, right? Like this. And then you use the momentum of your body to flip the weight up and then your whole body drops under it and then you lift it up like that. And I was watching my buddy do this lift and he was repping about 220 pounds. And my whole football team was there watching him do this because he was just a feat of a man watching him do it. And then it was my turn. And I'm much larger than my buddy. And so in my head and heart, I said, I'm probably much stronger than my buddy. And so I decided my first time, if he can do 220, I can at least do 240 because I am just that much stronger than him. Keep in mind, this was my first time doing the power clean. So I get up there and you have these things called straps and I get the straps on there and I get it up to my weight. And listen, immediately when I lifted it to right here, I realized this is a lot heavier than I thought. <laughs> I mean, I felt it, my whole body was screaming. But listen, all of the varsity coaches are watching. All of the varsity football team is watching. 
All 3,500 people in the high school are watching, <laughs> kind of. And I remember getting there and just thinking in my head, I've got to get this up. And I had the momentum to get the bar to my chest and get under it. But then something happened. It was an act of God to teach me humility. I got under the weight and my, my bottom was almost on the floor when I started falling backwards. I had the momentum to get the weight to here, but not to get the weight to standing up. Do you understand what I'm saying today? So today what I want to do is I want to talk to you about how to gain the momentum to not just get under it, but to walk with it. We're going to learn to walk with that momentum. And it was really interesting uh, after I had that, I remember this day because I remember I was laying under the bar and the bar was over my neck. And I wasn't suffocating because the bar was just high enough. And I just remember looking like, Lord, there's nothing I can do from here. <laughs> and I got a really cool perspective of my uh, weight room at the school as I looked up there and had some friends lift the bar off of me. And just so you know, just in case you're worried, I did not die. I'm okay. I'm here. I'm alive. And, and if you're curious, I also did not make varsity football. So anyways... Uh, <laughs> And I'm in therapy. But okay, so today what I want to share with you is how we can maintain momentum in our lives. That's our main idea. Uh, I want to talk to you about maintaining momentum. To this point in Joshua, we're going to be in Joshua 24 today. To this point in our story of Joshua, he has got the people into the promised land, crossed over the Jordan. And then the moment they crossed over the Jordan, they had to fight the battle of Jericho. And so they fought the battle of Jericho and uh, they began their conquest moving inward into the promised land and at this point they have now literally almost completely conquered the people that they are fighting to get out of the land and they are acquiring that land but what happens when they acquire the land is there is a tendency and some of you know about this tendency is once you get into the land there is a tendency to get comfortable in your spots anybody ever been comfortable in their life You've never been comfortable. Wow, that's rough. We'll pray for you. Maybe Pastor Mike can get you some freedom too because comfort's not a terrible thing, but when you get comfortable being comfortable, it's where the Lord would call us to risk and to move into the deeper levels of him. And the Lord, at this point in the story of Israel, is calling them into not just the conquest of the land, but the conquest of of the world with the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the, the encouragement from Joshua in his last me message to the Israelites is how to maintain momentum. And so we're going to be in two places today, Joshua chapter 40, uh, 24 as well as Philippians chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them at this time. If you're following along on our app, you can go there with us and we're going to be beginning first in Philippians chapter 3. And I'd ask that out of reverence for God's word, you'd stand to your feet at this time, as we are in Philippians chapter 3 together. <clears throat> and I want us to all read this together. Ready? Read. Not... put Philippians chapter 313 back up for me I want to show you something today right before that period in the middle of there it says I don't consider myself to yet have taken hold of it you know there's this there's this danger and there's this warning in God's word of what to do once you've taken hold of it and today what I want to talk to you is how to maintain momentum once you take hold of the promise. Let's pray. Father, we want, to take, we want to take this moment to just lift you high. And Jesus, today, this morning, all morning long, what's been on my head and my heart is our country. And so, Lord, together today as the people of God, we just take a moment to just pray a blessing on our country. 
Lord Jesus, would you bless those in leadership over us? Lord, would you protect us from the hand of the evil one? And Lord Jesus, for those who are prepping to defend our country in a very real way, I ask God that you would bless our armed forces. Father, I pray right now, Jesus, that you would protect them, Lord Jesus. Protect us, God. Give us wisdom as a country as to the correct moves. And Lord Jesus, we are asking for a blessing, Jesus, to come out of the midst of what seems to be a very dark season. And so, Lord Jesus, we ask for your blessing upon it. God, today as we go into your word, I ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would encourage our souls on how to maintain momentum. And I'm asking, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word today. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said together, amen. amen. Hey, would you turn to someone, give them a high five or a handshake, tell them you're glad they're here today. I, told, uh, I titled our message today, Past, Present, and Future, Past, Present, and Future, but I could have easily titled this message, Old Guys Rule. I could have easily, you ever seen those shirts that say, Old Guys Rule? No, you've never seen those shirts before? I can't wait till I can wear those shirts. Old Guys Rule, because here's what's happening, Joshua is an old guy at this point. And, you know, I had this big slip up this week when I was describing someone that we led to Jesus. And I said there was an older gentleman that was at our church that I led to Jesus. And I said he was in his early to late 40s. And someone goes, and so I, <laughs> church, I just need to say this to you. I'm sorry. I didn't mean he was an older guy. I was stuck in my Bible study of Joshua. And I'm just sorry. I didn't mean he's old because I'm closer to that than, okay, anyway. So, not old, um, but I want to say that he's an older guy now. He's had great victory in his life. You've got to remember the story of Joshua. In his formative years, he spent time with the great liberator Moses. Um, in his later years, he led God's people into the battle for the promised land. He saw the plagues of Egypt. He saw the parting of the Red Sea, the trip through the desert to the edge of the promised land, and then 40 years of wandering. He saw God part the Jordan River, crumble the walls of Jericho, said, enemies into panic. He also saw the punishment to Israel because of Achan's sin and the restoration of the blessing of the presence of God. He has led a full life. And at this point, Joshua is going to have that old guy rule type of message to Israel. He's saying, hey, I've led you this far with God's power and presence, and I want to leave you with my swan song. I want to give you the best possible words that I can give you in hopes that you cannot fall prey to the plans of the evil one, but that you can be strong and courageous as you establish yourself in this land. And that old guy's rule swan song message is found in Joshua chapter 24, Joshua 24, beginning in verse Verse 14. We're going to start there together. Joshua 24, verse 14. If you're there, say amen. amen. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Now fear the Lord and serve him with what? Throw away gods your ancestors were beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Let's say that together, beginning with but. Ready? Read. Like Joshua making this strong statement. You go ahead and do whatever you feel led to do. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Who had that as a doormat coming into their house when they were a kid? Anybody have that as a doormat? Who's seen that as on a placard on a wall somewhere? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua is making a parallel in this statement. 
And the parallel is you can choose to compromise your momentum and go back to what got you into captivity in the first place, or you can continue to serve the Lord and maintain momentum. You see, church, what I see in this part of Scripture is that Joshua is challenging the Israelites to remember what got them to the promise in the first place. What got them to the promise in the first place was not compromise. It was serving the Lord with all they had. You remember that verse in the book of Psalms where the psalmist asked the question, how can a young man keep his path straight? Do you remember that verse in the book of Psalms? And the answer to that question was, by loving God with part of your heart. So even the kids know it. It's all of your heart. Church, I want to share with you the great robber of momentum in your life. Are you listening? The great robber of momentum in your life. It's obvious to me, and I pray that as you read God's word, it's obvious to you. The great robber of momentum in the believer's life is compromise. It's compromise. It's allowing in gods from your past, gods of control, gods of lust, gods of addiction. It's allowing this false idol God worship back into your life. And when you allow that false God worship back into your life, you are not living to the fullness of who God has called you to be, and you will soon begin to see the fruits of lost momentum in your life. And Joshua He wants nothing to do with it, right? He draws a line in the proverbial sand and says, you decide for yourself today what you want to do. But as for me and my house, we're crushing compromise. We're going to maintain momentum by crushing compromise. That's the first way I want to encourage you to maintain momentum. You do that by crushing compromise compromise. And I love how Joshua wraps up this story. It's very similar to the way that it starts. It starts, remember, way back in in Joshua chapter 1 when the Lord continues to encourage Joshua to get and keep momentum. He encourages Joshua to be strong and what? Courageous. That was the worst courageous I've ever heard in my life. You sounded so courageous that I laughed at you. Be strong in what? I saw the men go, (laughs) be strong and courageous. But he says, in order for you to be strong and courageous, Joshua 1 verse 8 says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. And you might be wondering today, church, what is this book of the law that Joshua was referring to in Joshua chapter 1? Well, the reality is that Joshua was probably referring to a verse in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 6 through 7 where the the author of Deuteronomy tells us that the Lord your God, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before who? That's what the Lord said. And so when Joshua is is instructing Israel to keep the book of the law always on their lips, what he is reminding them to do is over and over again, don't let the compromise of other gods rise up in your life because when the compromise of other gods rise up in your life, you are giving yourself over to idol worship whether you know it or you don't. And it's really interesting how that concept of idol worship happens in the life of a believer. No one wakes up on fire for Jesus and says, I am going to become an idol worshiper today. Like, I haven't seen that t-shirt or bracelet that people are like, I am so excited about idol worship. But can I share with you? It sneaks in, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Come on, somebody. It sneaks in, doesn't it? It sneaks in little by little. Who's been a believer for longer than 20 years in the room? Thank you. Oh, 
I love you. God, that's so cool. Praise the Lord. Over 20 years, right? So for those of you that have been Christian for over 20 years, you know. We never wake up in a bed and say, oh, you know what? I'm so glad that now I'm worshiping idols in my life. Idol worship comes in not from deciding today I'm going to worship idols. It comes in through steady bits of compromise. Steady bits of compromise. And today what I want to encourage you to do is to maintain momentum by crushing that compromise. There should be no other gods before the Lord. Joshua 1.8 reminds us to keep the book of the law always on our lips. Meditate on it day and night so that we can be prosperous and, 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 and successful in the land. Joshua 22 verse 5, but be very careful to com- keep the commandment of the law of the book of Moses always on your life. lips. Joshua 23 verse 6, be strong and very courageous. Be very careful to obey all that is written. Joshua 23.11, so be very careful to love the Lord your God and only the Lord your God. Are you seeing a theme, church? There is a challenge from the Lord to Joshua and from Joshua to Israel to be very careful to place guards around your heart so that idol worship does not creep in. And it's challenging. And it's challenging. Listen, I've been a pastor 15 years. I've been a believer longer than that. That's probably good news, right? (laughs) You don't want the, never mind. I've <laughs> been a believer a long time, and I'll share with you, I oftentimes find myself falling prey to idol worship. And let me share with you how idol worship manifests in my life, and, and you can take it or leave it, and just, just hear it like this. I, as the leader of a movement, get a call from the Lord that typically comes through the community of God that I'm working with, but every so often the Lord will speak to me clearly and say, you are to do this. You are to do this. And listen, as a believer in Jesus and a leader in the church, I have got to be faithful to do what God has told me to do. Here's where it gets difficult. When there's people that are part of what God has called me to do, and they come to me and they say, Pastor Mike, I love you so much. And I was just wondering, you know, I was thinking about this this week, and I just I was just wondering, and, and what they will do is they won't tell me to 180, or they won't tell me to run opposite of the way God has called me to run, but what they'll do is they'll just say, wouldn't you mind just doing it this way instead? Got really quiet in the room. Wouldn't you mind just trying it this way, not that way? It's not that that way is bad. It's just this way is the way that I'm used to. And in that moment, I have a decision to make because I love people. Did you know that? I love people. I do. Like, I would live my life in a giant group hug if I had the choice because I love people. But I didn't sign up for ministry to please people. I signed up in ministry because I placed my preference on pleasing God. And there's a challenge in the hearts of leadership and believers in the church to keep their preference on pleasing God, not people. And the challenge is because we love people, but the enemy can work in the most deceptive ways to get you just slightly turned in the wrong direction and suddenly you're going in the opposite way of momentum and so i'll share with you sometimes i fall prey to the idol worship of people not god because i put my preference on pleasing people not god and i want to share with you today i'm going to do my best to crush that compromise i'm not going to crush you i'll hug you really strong because my preference is on pleasing god and that means that i will give priority to his word over the words of people all day long. Because at the end of the day, I will answer to the Lord, not how well I respond to your leading, but how well I respond to the leading of the Lord. So beloved of God, my challenge before you today, be very careful. Be very careful what you're allowing in to your life. Because it can end up, you could end up worshiping an idol and missing the full momentum that God has for you. We'll jump back in in Joshua chapter 24, verse 16. So remember the last words of Joshua 24 that we just read, right? Joshua draws the line for Israel and he says, y'all do what you want to do. 
You want to worship the gods of the Amorites? You guys do whatever you want to do. But for me, in my house, we are going to serve the Lord. And parents, can I just share with you right now? Um, You have the opportunity to do that with your household today. You know what I mean? Anyone ever had some turmoil in their house and you're just like, well, I just, anybody had turmoil in their house ever? You guys are looking at me like, oh, I'm still mad at you for the last thing you said. It's okay. We can laugh in church and have fun, church. We love each other. This is the body of Christ. But you ever had turmoil in your house before? Do you know that as a parent, you have the right biblically and just you have the right, feel commissioned for you to just stand strong in this promise, this promise right here. Kids, You can do whatever you want to do when you leave my house. But as long as you're under my roof, this is my mom told me this so many times and I'm laughing on the inside right now. As long as you're in my house, we, this house, I pay the mortgage on this house. I turn the lights on in this house. I brought you in this world. I can take you out of this world. (laughs) We're getting a little far right now. But you can declare over your household You can do whatever you want when you're 19 and can pay your own bills. (laughs) 19, you can't pay your own bills. But you can do whatever you want. But as for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. We're serving the Lord. Make that declaration over your family. You tell the house, this is the way it's going to be. Remove free will from your household. I'm just encouraging you today. Okay, anyways. So... Joshua challenges Israel to do these things, and then he goes back, and, he, and this is Israel's response in verse 16, Joshua 24, verse 16. Then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey. And among all the nations through which we traveled, the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. I want to read that last sentence with you one more time, beginning with we. Ready, read. We too... The declaration from the people of God, Israel says, we too will serve the Lord. And I thought it was a really interesting thing that they did there. In order to answer the question of whether or not they were going to serve the Lord, they did something that I encourage believers to do every once in a while. They did this. They were pressing on forward toward the promised land, and the promised land was before them. It was in their hands. It was in their acquisition. But to answer the question if they were going to continue to serve the Lord, Israel did this for a second. They went like this. What'd they do? They looked back. They looked back. And by looking back, they saw a memory they saw a reflection of a very important attribute of the Lord. When they looked back in their past, they saw fruit of a faithful God. Let me ask you a question, church. When you look back on the story of your life, do you see fruit of a faithful God? Has God been faithful to you, church? Has God saved you, church? Listen, and this is the reality for Israel. They're saying, look, the God who saved us will continue to be faithful to us, so we're going to serve him with our entire lives. And so church today, if you are finding yourself in a little bit of a loss of momentum, I want to talk to someone today who feels like they're losing in life, who feels like God has lost his faithfulness. For those of us that feel that way this morning, take a moment and just look back and remember how faithful God has been in your past. Sometimes, guys and gals, friends and family, we can maintain momentum by just remembering what we were saved from. Oh, man. 
Man, sometimes we like to build an idol about how cool our life was before Jesus. And how funny it is about all the, the, the shenanigans we were involved with before the grace of God grabbed hold of our hearts. But can I share with you, church, who you were before Jesus was leading you on a path to your eternal destruction, and it's not a joke. The faithfulness of the Lord will keep momentum for us in our lives if we remember. And listen, you're like, well, Mike, I don't have all that tragic of a story. So it's not that helpful for me to remember what I was saved from. That's because you forgot what you were saved from. You weren't saved from a lifestyle. You weren't saved from an addiction. You were saved from the gates of hell. From an eternal... Oh, listen, we're getting politically incorrect up in here today. I didn't come to church to hear that. What you come for church for? <laughs> I want to encourage you to understand today that Jesus didn't die on the cross because he was saving you just from your lifestyle. He died on the cross for salvation and eternal connection to you. And if you choose not to receive that eternal connection, you will receive the, the thing I said in the beginning, and that is an eternity without him. Church, sometimes it's helpful for us to just remember what we were saved from. And what I would share with you is Israel remembered that they were saved from slavery, that God showed them miracles, that he saved their lives. He watched over them on the journey. He protected them from their enemies. He gave them the land they were living in. Do you see what they did there? They just built a list. They just built a list of things that they were grateful for and reasons why they were going to serve the Lord because of God's faithfulness. They built a list. And beloved of God, that's my challenge to you today. You will maintain momentum in your life if you'll remember what you were saved from. And if you're forgetting what you're saved from, just get yourself a journal and start making a list of what you were saved from. And, you know, I, I built a list, and here's my list, and I'll just go ahead and throw it out there for you. I was saved from loneliness, depression, fear of failure. The Lord became a father to this fatherless kid. He saved me from an addicted life that would have led to my death. He gave me a wife and three awesome kids. He's broken poverty off of me. He's been generous to me. He's loved me. Even when I failed, he's loved me. He's believed in me. He's anointed me. He's blessed me. Oh, come on, church. You've got to have a list of what you were saved from and two and that's what I want to encourage you to do because it will keep momentum in your life if you have a list you know on the way to church today I was remembering my list because I woke up this morning and I didn't feel well and kind of felt like you know how it is when you get all pity party <laughs> and I got this long two minute drive to work and I was filled <laughs> But I was looking up and I was seeing the sun and I saw, I'm, I'm, you guys beginning to see the blossoms coming through. Oh man, it's a cool place to live this time of year, isn't it? Don't talk to me in December about it, but. <laughs> but I was sitting here on my, my drive to work this morning and I was, I, was, I was having this wrestling match between gratefulness for what God is doing and also just feeling bummed because I didn't feel well and feeling bad because my family doesn't feel well. But then I remember my list. And it reminded me of how faithful God has been every step of my journey. And you know, I just started sitting there singing and I started singing a hymn, which I do often when I'm alone in my car and when I'm in front of you all the time. I just started singing the hymn and I, then I realized I don't know the words. You guys ever done that when you start singing a hymn? You're like, great is thy faithfulness. You, know, you don't know the rest. But then I got into my office this morning and I looked up the lyrics and I just thought it was so appropriate. And I just wanted us to sing that together. I have the lyrics because I don't want to hear any mumbling going on. But, but I just want to know, like, has the Lord been faithful to you, church? Would you declare this song with me? Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not thy compassion, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. 
Everybody sing it. Come on now. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Whew, that felt good, didn't it? <laughs> Every once in a while, church, we just got to remember, great is the faithfulness of the Lord. Past behavior is an indicator of future behavior. And if the Lord has been faithful in your past, he'll be faithful in your future. We'll wrap this up in Joshua 24, verse 19. So people respond, they're going to serve the Lord. And then Joshua, the great leader, remember, old guys what? Old guys rule. And so Joshua's about to have that old guys rule moment right here. He says, Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is holy. He is a jealous God and he will not forgive your rebellion or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you. And he has been good to you. Joshua, don't, I, like, I, I insert myself in the story, and I'm like, Joshua, calm down, dude. Jeez, relax a little bit, buddy. What happened to great is thy faith? <laughs> like, he's just on this, like, you will not serve. But listen, I want to share with you something that great leaders do. When I was a junior in high school, another sports story, just brace yourself. My wrestling coach, who I tell stories about a lot, his name was Elias, great man of God, and, and he, he, he was challenging me uh, one day. I told, I told my wrestling coach that I wanted to drop down two weight classes because I felt like I'd have an opportunity to maybe win a match if I was a little bit lighter. And, uh, and he, goes, he goes, Mikey, that's cool, man, but let's just be real, buddy. You love Burger King way too much to drop down <laughs> to... And I was like, I was like, no, no, no. He's, he's like, no, no, no. Mike, I just, I love you too much to, to watch you fail, but there, there's no way you could do this. And I'm like, excuse me? Like, I found myself going like, what? You don't think I can do this? And he's like, no, it's not that I don't think you can't. I know you can't and you won't. <laughs> and I'm like, so as, as, as a junior in high school, I, I was sitting there saying, well, guess what? Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to stop eating Burger King. And I, he, he, he let, literally, in that moment, he told me, he said, Mikey, if you want to do this, I'll help you do it. But I just, I, I just, I can't imagine you're going to do this. And, and he's like, he's like, commit to me right now that you're going to drop down two weight classes. That means you're going to lose 30 pounds. You're going to lose 30 pounds. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do it. Let's do this thing, coach. I'm in. Like, I was so, like, enraged that he didn't think that I could do it. It was like reverse psychology plunged me to the point of saying, I am going to do this. No more Burger King for breakfast. I'm driving straight to the gym, and I'm working out. And so literally for two days, I drove past Burger King. <laughs> I did. I was disciplined. But on that third day, on that third day, <laughs> I'm going to preach about the third day next weekend. <laughs> the hash browns were a frying. And I, this is a true story. I drive into the parking lot of Burger King on the way to school. I was disciplined for two days. And when I get in the parking lot, you know what I saw? Coach Elias. <laughs> And of course, I go to this place and saying, hey, coach, I saw you in the parking lot. I just wanted to see what was up, you know, like. <laughs> Point be taken, church, what I'm sharing with you is what Joshua is doing this moment is he is challenging Israel to do something they can do but won't do. So he's challenging them the best to come out of them. And sometimes good leaders use this reverse psychology to find that inner strength inside of you. And Joshua found, finds the strength when he tells them this. And in verse 21, the resolve in the people arises and it says, but the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, you are a witness against your 
yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are a witness, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, let's say this together, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. It finishes how it starts. It finishes how it starts. It finishes with this reminder from Joshua to Israel and this reminder from Mike to my friends. When it's all said and done, church, build up a resolve to keep God first in your life. Keep God first in your life. You will maintain momentum by keeping God first in your life. Do you remember how Joshua described the Lord? He said, our God is a jealous God. It's not an attribute of God. We spend a lot of time talking about it because it makes you sound like that freshman boyfriend with low self-esteem. But the reality is, God is a jealous God. And his jealousy is not because of his insecurity. Did you know that? God's jealousy is not because of his insecurity. His jealousy is rooted and established in love. He understands that if God takes any place in your heart other than first, you are lacking the best possible life you could ever lead. His jealousy is rooted in mercy. And today I want to remind you, church, God is jealous because he wants for you what's best for you. So keep him first in your life and when you do that you maintain momentum by keeping God first I'll invite the worship team back up and we'll close in a time of worship and I just want to remind you today church that the Lord has been faithful to you keep him first in your life crush compromise and allow God to help you be thankful for his faithfulness and if you do that you'll maintain momentum and you'll not just grab a hold of a promise and then let go of it. You'll grab hold of a promise and be a carrier of that promise and release that promise on others all around you. Why? Because the Lord is so good. His love is so real and it's so powerful that we've got to be a group of people that stand together to our feet and say we're holding God's promise, His love for us, and we're carrying it everywhere we go. The Lord our God is one, so we must love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. Let's cut, crush compromise and maintain momentum together, church. Amen.